Well, good morning, Americas. Good afternoon, Europe. And good evening to those of you in the East. Uh, my name is Steve Lewis, and I'm a senior director of RISTEC uh, based here in the UK. Thank you very much for joining us, and welcome to this RISTEC seminar, uh, which is actually the final uh, webinar in the current program. Uh, the topic today is about a LARP assessment. Uh, an organization can always apply additional resources to further reduce safety risk, but when is enough enough? Hopefully, we can provide some useful and practical insights for you. Before we get going, quick spot of housekeeping. Uh, we've muted everybody so that the sound won't be uh, distorted by background noise. Um, and if you'd like to ask questions, and we really do encourage uh, questions uh, as we go, then please use the instant messaging function. So if you just click on that little uh, white speech bubble in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, and then type your message in. Uh, what I'll do is I'll keep track of those uh, questions as we go through the presentation, and then at the end, we'll cover as many of them as we, as we can and uh, within the 40 minutes or so that we've got available today. Okay, uh, I'd now like to briefly introduce RISTEC uh, for those of you who don't already know us. Apologies if you've already heard this a dozen times before. I will aim to be rather quick. Uh, we have over 300 people uh, across 16 offices worldwide. Uh, we're part of TV Rhineland, who are a 2 billion euro provider of testing, inspection, and certification uh, services. Uh, we operate across five business lines. Our main business line is consulting, where we provide a, a pretty broad range of risk and safety management services uh, to help reduce and manage risk. Uh, we also provide online and classroom training and postgraduate education, uh, including an MSc in risk and safety management. Uh, we also provide associates who are available to work at client relocations, and that's to help fill resource or skill shortages uh, on the client side. Uh, we also provide industrial inspection and integrity management services. Uh, and then also we conduct uh, research and development in the field of risk and safety management. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our presenter today, uh, is Andy Lidstone. Uh, Andy's a principal consultant. He's based in Ristex Warrington office in the UK. Uh, he's got well over 30 years experience in the field of safety and risk assessment. Uh, he's worked in a number of uh, high hazard industries, including oil and gas, mining, nuclear and defense, transport, manufacturing and chemical sectors. Uh, and more recently, he's also been heavily involved in the development of uh, carbon capture and storage projects. Uh, especially over the last 25 years, his work's mainly been in the oil and gas industries, uh, working on projects including uh, refineries, mines, gas plants, drilling plants, logistics operations. Uh, his expertise in terms of tools and techniques is pretty wide across uh, qualitative and quantitative approaches, such as hazard identification, bow tie analysis, fault and inventory analysis, failure modes and effects analysis, consequence modeling, QRA, uh, safety HEC cases, and of course, alarm assessments. Uh, so we have the right person for the job today. So over to you, Andy. Thank you, Steve. Uh, there's nothing like being introduced formally to suddenly make you feel very old. Um, thank you very much for to those of you coming along. Um, as Steve said, so what we'd like to, to do today is to, to go through the, um, the basic ideas behind the LARP and the steps that we want to go through for all of this. Now, that we have, as Steve mentioned, this is a, one of a, a number of series of uh, webinars we've been doing on a number of different uh, risk topics. And some of those have been based around the, the basic principles of risk assessment um, that uh, you can see uh, as an example of the ISO 31000 figure in the, uh, the top right-hand side of the screen of this continuous uh, structured approach towards uh, risk assessment and going through the, the key steps of uh, risk identification, risk analysis and risk evaluation, which leads us into on the ISO 31000 picture of this idea of risk treatment, of looking to see whether or not we can make risks better. And the center of the slide, I, I sort of uh, summarized that ba basic process again within there. And when we get down to the, the evaluation stage, um, by and large, there's really only ever four things that we can do 
Uh, once we know the risks that we've got, once we know the controls that we've got, there's really only four things that we can do at that point. We, we can avoid the risk, we can walk away from the risk completely. Um, that is always going to be the most effective risk management measure that we've got, but it's also the most restrictive. It would take away our opportunity to work within particular markets, particular activities or so. We, we can transfer the risk, we can give the risk to somebody else. That might be by legal, financial uh, approaches, it might be by insurance, things like that. Uh, again, that has its benefits, but it can also have drawbacks. There's going to be financial penalties associated with that, and you know, it, it, it's not a hundred uh, percent method, hundred um, percent effective means of always getting rid of the risk. But for most of the time, and particularly when we're talking within the high hazard industries, we've made the decision we're going to be in a particular area, a particular business, and therefore we've accepted the risk within it. And we retain those risks associated with those activities within our organization. And therefore, our abilities to, uh, to improve, to treat the risks, come down to the, the tent, center two things within that. We can reduce the risk. Um, and when we have got, so we can put in place additional controls, measures, etc., cetera, to, to further improve, either prevent the risks from being released or to mitigate the consequences. And when we've got to a point where we accept those risks, then we retain, we accept the risks within our organization. And it's this key part of moving from reducing to accepting. This is where the concept of a LARP coming in is. When, how do we go about, what's a structured process for making sure that we have achieved a level of risk that we can consider is a LARP? When do we stop reducing the risks and when do we get to the point of saying that we accept the risks so the the basic ideas of, of a LARP, just to define it, if you like, uh, a LARP as low as reasonably practicable. It's the basis, the fundamental basis of the whole UK health and safety uh, system. Um, and it applies at all levels within the UK and United Kingdom. So it goes all the way from control of workplace hazards, um, generalised risk controls, for example, for those of you in the UK, the, the Management of Health and Safety at Work Act, uh, requires us to be looking after a LARP and to reduce those risks as far as reasonably practical, all the way up to the high hazard industries. And so it is a, uh, if you like, a, a UK invention. I apologize to the rest of the world at that point. But it's something that's been uh, adopted widely elsewhere. A number of other international companies have adopted it, a number of other regulators have adopted it. And what he's basically asking us to do is to always seek to improve where those improvements are practicable so that we can we can accept a risk but in making sure that we can accept that risk we should be making sure that we have done the best that we possibly can practically can sorry to ensure that those risk levels are as low as reasonably practical and what this basically comes down to is what looking to improve and then objectively uh, trying to assess the time, cost and difficulty of um, further risk reduction against the amount of benefit that we're going to get out of it and then to make a decision at that point. And as it says on the slide there, a lot of this arises, or certainly the ideas of acceptability arises from a, uh, a 1940s court judgment um, it, uh, was it related to a fatal, fatal accident within the, the coal industry. And I've sort of taken a, a key, some key parts of the, the court judgment of there and highlighted a number of um, the key phrases within this. And, and this, this court judgment led to a, a number of um, key points, key principles that are then embodied within the, the LARP concept. And one of the key things in there is that, you know, the word is practicable. It's not as low as reasonably possible. A possible means we would have to do ad absolutely everything to reduce risk. The, the LARP principle is about practicability. So it's saying that there is no such thing as absolute safety, that there is always going to be a certain level of risk retained and that yes we have to we have to do the best we practically can to reduce that level of risk but we are going to retain some level of risk and so we need to to look to improve we need to evaluate those improvements but 
the, one of the key things in there is that this court judgment introduced this idea of gross disproportion, that it's looking to, if you like, put a, a bias on the, the implementation of, the, of increasing safety. Um, so this, this gross disproportion becomes a bias weighting the decisions in favor of implementation. So if you like, it's the, the benefit side of the equation, the risk reduction side of the equation becomes a lot greater than the, the sacrifice side of the equation at that point. And so we, we own the risks, the, um, the duty holder, we are responsible for the risks, so we have to be in the position of evaluating that process, evaluating the risks, making sure that we are a lab. And I tend to think of this as a, um, if you like, three steps, three hurdles, um, hurdles probably the wrong words, but three staircases that we have to climb to be in the place uh, of assuring ourselves that we have done the best we practicably can. So the, the first stage, the, the basics is we, we have to have an acceptable level of risk. Um, we have to meet the law. We cannot use a LARP arguments. We cannot use cost and time di difficulty arguments to avoid, uh, absolve ourselves from our legal responsibilities. We have to um, satisfy the law. We have to put in place the measures that the law requires. And then we also have to ha have an acceptable level of risk. We, um, we also have to be aware of and to implement as far as reasonably practical the ideas of good practice and I'll come on to this in a bit more detail at a later date and if you like these represent the, the basics these are what we must have in place once we got to the point of what we must have in place then the key step of the, any alert demonstration has to be could we do anything better and the key thing about a LARP is we're always seeking to improve. We have to ask ourselves, is this the best we can do? But once we've identified if we could do anything better, then we have to do the practicability evaluation of comparing the benefits and the sacrifices. So looking then at the, the first step on this um, assurance staircase, if you like, that um, the first thing is we have to have an acceptable level of risk. Um, so we have different approaches towards assessing risks. We, we might have a, a qualitative approach uh, uh, towards assessing our risks. We may rely on numerical judgments towards assessing those risks, but we have to be in the position of making some judgment. We have to understand what we've got. We have to understand the controls that we're relying on and then to make that decision. Is this an acceptable level of risk to me? Now, there may be as I said, there may be numerical values for this, or maybe qualitative values, and there may be other things that also um, might influence this. There may be values, acceptability that are, are being set by regulators, by society, but a lot of the time we may self-regulate. So we might be in a position whereby we are, as a company, averse to a particular level of risk, and therefore we might seek to, to have additional controls in place. So our tolerance for the risk might be lower than other areas where people um, might be facing the same level of risks at that point. And that tolerance might be uh, affected by the frequency or the consequences that we de we're dealing with at that point. And as part of the, the ideas of, of risk acceptability, risk tolerability, um, the, the regulators within the United Kingdom came up with this idea of a tolerability of risk uh, framework that said that, you know, on a basic on a very simplistic level, we have three levels of risk. At the top end, we've got risks that are unacceptable. We can't allow for them to happen. And at the bottom end, we've got what are the, the broadly acceptable. I'm not going to call them trivial, but they, you know, the minor low-level risks that are always sat there in the background. And within that, we've got where, unfortunately, the large majority of our risks tend to sit is what we call as the tolerable region. Sometimes people will call this... Um, well, a lot of times you hear people saying that this is the acceptable region or the tolerable region, and it's not. The, the specific wording that is put into, into this tolerability risk framework is it's tolerable if it's a LARP. If we just say that the risk in the centre part is tolerable, we're just implying, yes, we can live with it. 
That's not what a LARP is asking us to do. A LARP is saying, yes, we can live with it, but only if we have challenged ourselves to say, is that the best? Could we improve upon it at that point? So we have to have some means of assessing the tolerability of the risk of, of making a, uh, an argument as to whether or not our risks are acceptable to us. And generally, as a, uh, a simplification, then those might be a qualitative judgment. We base on our, our, our knowledge, our experience to say whether or not we believe that the risk is acceptable. Uh, it may be a semi-quantitative type assessment, you know, so things like a risk assessment matrix can help us reach a decision as to whether or not these things are acceptable. Or um, it may be quantitative, in which case we might be looking at numerical estimates of risks, risks to the individual. Um, generally, we tend, from a safety point of view, we're looking at risk of death. Um, and it, or it may be risks of a particular level of harm reaching to society at that point. And as, as a general rule, the, uh, as the risks get larger and as the complexity of the situation gets bigger, we move from the ideas of qualitative to semi-quantitative to um, quantitative. And these are different ways in which we can accrue information to help us make decisions as to whether or not our risks are acceptable. So that's sort of then the the first staircase we have to have an acceptable level of risk we have to be in the position of making that judgment that the risk is acceptable to us then the the next um piece on the staircase the the, the second hurdle that we have to cross as i mentioned was it be the idea of good practice now good practice um again we have a a legal um or a guidance definition that uh, is at the top of that slide um and HSE in that case is the health and safety executive, the, the UK's regulator. And good practice, if you like, represents those things that in general society, industry has recognised as being reasonably, pra um, reasonably practical. We have over time said that this is what we think is going to be a reasonably practical measure to deal with a particular um, scenario. So it might be the, the rules for construction, it might be the, um, the the rules to operate things, it might be guidance issued by industry bodies, etc. And because it's, um, you know, uh, widely accepted, then it, te it tends to be, you know, this is the bare minimum that society and industry will accept. Now, we can deviate from good practice. There, you know, it's not one size fits all. There are always going to be deviations for particular areas, industries, etc. But it has to be an informed decision. If we are going to deviate from good practice, then we should be in the position of assessing whether or what the pluses and the minuses, the benefits and the sacrifices are going to be for each of those things. So the idea of risk acceptability is the first staircase, good practice is the second staircase. And on the, the earlier slide I mentioned that also had company standards in there. It might be you know, a lot of times company standards also represents the, the minimum acceptance criteria that we have to put in place. Once we've understood what we have and we've satisfied we've done ourselves at that point, then we get into the idea of a LARP assessment. So a LARP assessment goes through these basic steps. We first have to seek to improve. Can we improve upon what we've got? Now, these might be putting in additional controls. It might be improving the quality of the controls we've got. So it might be having a better set of um, protective gloves, so we improve the quality of it. It might be improving the quality of the training, so we're improving upon the controls that we have in place. Or it might be putting in place an additional safeguard, and an additional protective measure, a hard line trip or something like that. For all of those, so we need to be in the position of identifying those and then to say, okay, what are the pluses and minuses? What are the benefits and the sacrifices for that? If you want to be very informal about it, how much bang am I going to get for my buck? If I was to do this, what would be the risk, the risk benefits I get? What would be the sacrifices, the time, cost, trouble, difficulty, all of the things that I'm going to incur by get, achieving that certain level of um, risk benefit? And as with 
uh, I mentioned the ideas of um, risk assessments, that we have varying levels of depth proportional to the complexity of the situation, the, um, the amount of uh, the level of risk, etc. Um, similarly, the depth of assessments that we will put in place, and I'll come on to this in a, in a moment, should be proportional to the level of risk. As with risks, they're our risks, therefore we have to be in the position of assuring ourselves that we have done this. So we have to um, have something that allows us to make an informed decision that um, whether or not we should adopt a particular control measure. And that might be indicated by you know, some things we're more aware of, some things society might be more um, aware of or more concerned about. So that might drive us down into a more detailed demonstration as to why we choose to accept or not accept a particular risk reduction measure at that point. And a couple of key considerations with that, you know, we, we, we are responsible for all the risks that we own. Um, you know, they are our responsibilities, but we also have a responsibility to our personnel that um, to, to make sure that they are safe within our particular workplace. So if there are external risks that can affect us, then we have a duty to make sure that even though we cannot control risks from outside of our facility coming onto our facility, we have a duty to make sure that we've done the best we practically can about looking at um, making sure that our personnel are protected from the events that could affect us. And what we're doing is to look at, as I said, the benefits and the sacrifices, the things that, that help us make those decisions. So the benefits, typically, it's always going to be the reduction in harm, um, mostly to the workforce, but also to the public. The sacrifices, money, time, trouble, difficulty, all of those things that are um, going to be um, incurred at that point. And I mentioned this idea of gross disproportion, this weighting factor that we put in place to err on the side of, of safety. Uh, so we're weighting the, the benefit side of the equation, the risk reduction side of the equation in favour of implementation, if you like, so that uh, every, um, every dollar, every quantum of uh, risk benefit that we get is weighted greater than the, the cost side of things. So you, you can th think of it, I tend to think of this an awful lot with regards to the idea of um, seesaws, that I might have a certain amount of risk reduction that I get from a, um, a implementing a particular measure, and I then, um, I would apply my gross disproportion to that. And the, I, please keep in mind at this point, this gross disproportion may be a qualitative judgment or it may be a numerical judgment. There is nothing in the ALARP principle that says um, a LARP has to be a numerical judgment. That's one of the biggest misconceptions that people have got. So a LARP can be a, a, a value-driven judgment. It doesn't have to be a numerical-driven judgment. But this idea of gross disproportion weights the benefit um, over the implementation cost. So at this point, even though if you look at the absolute values, the cost is greater than the benefit, um, and so this case, it, it is not applicable, but it, here, the cost, even though it's great in absolute terms, the cost is greater than the risk reduction. When we apply this disproportion test, then it means that the net risk reduction is greater than the, um, the net uh, cost. There are various approaches to this. Um, we can't really go into it in a lot of detail at this point, but typically if we were doing it from a numerical value, um, then the, the gross, gross disproportion sort of sits in the range of 1 to 10. Um, that's a very broad brush approach, but again, I want to reiterate that um, a LARP is not just about cost-benefit analysis. A LARP can be achieved and most often can be achieved from a, uh, a consideration of qualitative judgment. So once we've established what we've got, um, we've looked and come up with the uh, potential risk reduction measures, then we're in the position of saying, well, okay, let, we have to evaluate those. And broadly speaking, we've got three ways of doing this. We can make a qualitative judgment based on our knowledge and our experience. Two people go out to, to change a light bulb um, and, a, and the facility with a ladder, they walk up to the site, they, um, when they get to the, uh, the lamppost they see that there's a busy road behind, beside it, they put up a crash barrier to divert the traffic around it. They are 
That's an alert judgment. They've identified the risks, they've evaluated potential risk reduction measure, they said it was appropriate, and they've put it in place. There, we've made an alert judgment. That is very good. It's, it's, it can be, um, it's very difficult to audit that you've ever done something like this, and it, and it also tends to be very limited in, in based on what we've seen, what we've uh, come across in the past. We can improve that by bringing a bit more rigor into the process, bringing a bit more structure into the process. And so we can bring in you know, a, a something like a, a cost-benefit matrix at this point so that we can put in something like a, a benefit versus a sacrifice and then ask people to evaluate and to justify so that if we could put in a particular risk reduction measure i want i want to put in extra training okay so what benefit would that give me i think that would give me a low benefit well, why do you think that and let's have a discussion as to why we think that that is a, um, a particularly a low benefit and what would be the sacrifice and, and the cost associated with that you know, how uh, what is your judgment what is your opinion and so this use of these types of matrices um, gives us a, a lot better um, basis for making our decisions because it's forcing us to consider the um, both the sacrifice and the judgment it's, it's allowing us to have a discussion I, I very frequently use these for major hazard industries um, and it's done as part of a workshop so that we can uh, have interested parties, stakeholders around the table and to say, no, this is what we're going to do. This is what we think is plus. These are what the, the pluses and the minuses. I've used this for, for things like, as I mentioned, new training for, uh, for looking at whether or not we wanted to put in an additional safeguard onto an industrial plant for looking at, um, for running a facility with a, a safeguard possibly temporarily disabled for a limited period of time to, to go through and to look at those things. Now, there are some areas there where you can see that, you know, there are some yellow areas that we may not necessarily be able to necessarily make a decision at that point. And so we can um, use the ideas of quantified assessment to help us bring a bit more subject objectivity into this um, decision making process and so we can so we can use cost benefit analysis at that point to, to help supplement such a decision making process and so when we're talking about cost benefit analysis we're basically putting a numerical value and monetary value on both the costs the sacrifices the time the trouble the cost and the benefits uh, associated at that point and as just to reiterate, again, cost-benefit analysis does not mean we can um, disregard legal requirements. We cannot say it's too expensive to comply with the law. It just doesn't work that way. But um, we can use the cost-benefit analysis to give us an, a, a useful indication of what we have and what we should be doing. It's only part of the alert demonstration. We still have to make sure we've satisfied these three tests, these three staircases I showed earlier. And once we've identified additional risk we measures, then we can start putting in place something to say, OK, what are the costs? Some of the things we, we might have in place are up there. So the installation, the maintenance, the training, only those necessary and sufficient. They, you know, it's very easy to get carried away with gold plating and prove that black is white and that, every, that no risk reduction measure is ever going to be practicable because we over-egg over the pudding. On the other side, the, uh, the benefit side of things, then we're looking at, as I mentioned, the reduction in risk to, to, to workers, to the public. Um, we need to consider this over the entire lifetime of a facility because at year one we will get uh, a lot of costs incurred and a small amount of benefits. Years two, three, four, five, we're still going to accrue the, the benefits from the risk reduction, but we won't have necessarily the same capital expenditure costs. This does, however, mean that we have to put in place a value on a life. Now, this can be a very uh, difficult conversation to have and it's something that always needs to be um, treated sensitively and you know, nobody likes sort of this sort of level of discussion um, so you know you have to be aware of those but you know there are values that are put out uh, there to allow us um, to, to baseline um, to come up with values and and the original uh, work that was done by the regulator in the United Kingdom um, 
2001, they set a, a value at a million pounds. This is not how much we value a life, it's how much we value preventing a death. It's a very subtle distinction, but it is a key distinction. And you know, typically values now, you will see values quoted to about 1.6, 1.7 million pounds. Different com countries have different approaches to it. We can use this, as I said, cost-benefit analysis to give us a numerical value to help us, give us an extra piece of information to help us make these decisions. So to summarize then, the, um, the basic process for um, assuring ourselves that we are alive, we have to understand the risks. We have to understand what the, the risks are, where they come from. This is going back to the very first slide, the ideas behind the ISO 31000 approach. Um, so we have to understand what the risks are. We have to identify what the controls are in place um, that, and how those controls are put in place because that tells us how much risk that we've got in place. So are they good enough? So this is going to help us make a decision as to whether or not the, the risks are tolerable at that point. And then once we've assessed, if you like, so those first three boxes are getting us past the first two staircases, then once we understand what we have, we can start asking ourselves, could we improve? Could we make it better? To evaluate whether or not those things are reasonably practicable, and then to put those things in place. Just having the ideas doesn't reduce the risk. We still have to put the risks. We have to implement the measure, otherwise the risk will never improve. And then we have to be able in the position of documenting it so that we can learn from it, so that we can review it, so that we can come back to it at some point in the future. And also because stakeholders, other people might be interested at some point in the future. So that's the basic process. So key, key things um, about the whole idea of a LARP that as I said, the, the way I tend to view it is these three hurdles, these three staircases, that we have to meet the minimum uh, legal mandatory requirements, the, the, uh, the minimum risk acceptance criteria. We have to, to start with at least have a risk that is tolerable or broadly acceptable. We have to put in place the, uh, the ideas of good practice. Or these may be represented by industry, may be represented by uh, company standards as far as reasonably practical. We can deviate from them, um, but that should be a justified decision. That's the first two steps. Then to seek to improve, and there should always be this idea of a presumption of implementation. What more could I do? Why haven't I done it? We're not looking for excuses not to do stuff. We're looking for reason. We're looking for how we can put in place, but to make sure that it is practicable at that point. We're responsible for all reasonably foreseeable risks and the demonstration, our risk management demonstration, our risk management processes, our alert processes should be proportional to the level of risk. We have various tools and methods that are available to us. Um, we have various tools and methods available to us to do risk assessments. Similarly, if those are the approaches, qualitative, semi-quantitative or quantitative, that's what we do for risk assessment. That's also what we can do for a LARP assessment. That is to help us make the decision-making process at that point. And so that we can learn from it, as I said up then, documentation is, is always going to be a key part of this, such that we can come back and review it and make sure if we said we were going to put in a particular risk reduction measure and we thought it was going to give us a certain level of benefit, and then when we actually do it and we put that measure in place, it doesn't work as well as we thought it was going to do, other problems come up or something like that, or there's unforeseen circumstances and we're unable to do that, then we can go back to our documentation and say, yeah, okay, well, this was our second best option, but let's put this one in place at that point and so that we can continue to improve. And just as a, a final point, the the ISO 31000 circle that I showed on the very first slide, it's a continuous process. A LARP is not just something you do once to forget about it. A LARP is something that exists throughout the lifetime of our facility. We always need to be in the place of monitoring our risks, monitoring our controls, and looking to see whether or not we're managing the risks effectively, and could we improve upon that. And that is a lifetime commitment throughout our facilities.
I realise that this has been a very high speed run through. Um, I hope it's sort of raised some interesting thoughts for you. Um, and I'll, um, I will stop at that point and pass you back to Steve. Excellent. Uh, thanks very much, Andy. Yep, so we've certainly got time uh, for some questions. So please use the chat function and uh, get your questions typed in, please. Uh, we've got one in from Gerald. How can we relate hazard barriers to a LARP in terms of determining what is practicable, uh, especially for conducting safety critical tasks? Um, well, I, hazard barriers, I'm, I mean, hazard barriers, I'm assuming I would just take to mean as the control measures. So as part of our um, uh, risk assessment, I, if we're looking at safety critical task assessment, so we, we want to make sure that the, um, the procedures, the tools, the training that we give our personnel who are doing these safety critical tasks are suitable and sufficient to make sure that the the task will get done and that the uh, uh, that we are managing whatever the risk is going to be that the person is doing for that point that we need to evaluate the barriers we've got to make sure that the task is done to make sure that those barriers hazard barriers are in line with requirements and if the law says a person doing a particular task has to be trained to a certain level, then we have to make sure that that training has been done. Once we've cleared that, then there is always going to be the, um, you see, yeah, I've now trained somebody to the bare minimum. Could I make it better? Could I give them enhanced training? Could I provide them with additional time to do this particular task? Can I give them additional tools? Um, could I improve the lighting uh, around there? All of those might be things that could improve the performance of that particular task, which would make it less likely that um, a particular scenario might occur. And so by looking to improve the way that we do the task, that is part of an alert assessment. We look to improve, we evaluate the sacrifices and benefits. Thanks, Andy. Uh, question in from David. How does a LARP differ from BATNIC? Or are they uh, very much the same thing? Uh, how does society determine what is reasonable or what is ex excessive? <laughs> oh, there's two questions in one. That's cheating. Yes. Um, but a LARP, it very much is um, it's a safety argument. It's always come up as a, a, a safety um, approach that is developed out of the um, safety legislation. I mean, BATNIC um, is asking for the same sort of basic approaches. Um, so best available technology not entailing excessive costs. So the idea of not entailing excessive costs is directly applicable towards um, the uh, practicability, if you like, and particularly when you're looking at the regulation of major hazard industries in the United Kingdom, um, that is done by two statutory bodies, the Health and Safety Executive and the Environment Agency, and they have very similar approaches towards looking at the practicability and the assessment of practicability at that point. With regards to what society um, says is acceptable, well, society will influence it in two ways. I mean, society influences the laws that are passed, um, which will therefore influence um, the requirements that companies have to put in place. Um, but society will also directly influence uh, the activities of uh, certain industries. You only have to look at um, the societal impact on fracking as an industry within the United Kingdom. Um, companies were operating within the law, but society um, in the area did not accept that. So society um, managed to get the, uh, those operations shut down. So I mentioned briefly earlier on that uh, what is acceptable to us as a company might be driven by legislative requirements. It might be driven by our, leg by our own internal company requirements, but equally societal pressures might force us into um, a lower tolerance for a particular risk or a, a higher um, acceptance of a particular risk reduction measure. So a, uh, a company that's operating in somewhere where there's a lot of societal concern might implement a risk reduction measure because 
society is very concerned about it, whereas a similar company operating in an area with lower societal concern may not necessarily decide to implement that measure because they are not um, driven is the wrong word, but they they don't have as much pressure to implement it, and and so therefore the. the um, Similarly, society can influence what we as a, the duty holder, the risk owner, regards as an acceptable level of risk. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, Andy. Um, we've got a little bit more time, so I've, I've got a question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I think, in my experience, at a high hazard facility, then quite often a single very expensive engineering change can significantly reduce the risk. Um, but similarly, there can be a handful of much cheaper changes can get a decent re reduction in risk, uh, but not as much as that big single one-off spend. So how, how, how would an ALARP assessment unpack that situation? Well, the, um... The short answer is it depends, um, but that's not much of a, an answer. The, I, I, I hope I didn't leave anybody with the impression that you just choose the first example uh, or the first risk reduction measure that you come up with and then you, you say, well, if this one is acceptable to us or we consider this one is practical, well, then we implement that and just forget everything else. We, we should be looking to improve, uh, put in place what we think is the most once we've understood what our risk reduction measures are, and we've evaluated the practicabilities of those, then um, we need to be looking to put in place what we as regarding as the most practicable measure. And particularly if we've got, uh, as the example you gave, that certain, uh, what you might have one expensive but very effective measure against a number of um, cheaper, simpler methods that cumulatively would have the same level of effectiveness, we need to start considering, well, there are going to be different priorities that are going to come into play at that point. Company affordability might be one of them. Um, we may not be in the position to put into place something um, that is really expensive. But equally, if we're going to put in a big engineering solution and that's going to take two years before it gets fully implemented, then it's a probably a more reasonably practicable measure to put in the shorter term measures um, because they will have immediate benefits at that point. And you may also be looking at, well, as part of the, the practicability assessment, uh, if I put in a big engineering solution, then I might feel that that is more robust and therefore a better solution for me than more um, people-centered easier to implement measures that rely on changes to procedures and things like that because they may be less robust in the future and therefore more likely to break at some point in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, we've got no more questions, so I think we can wrap up now. Uh, what we will do is make a recording available uh, to everybody. It will be early next week now. Um, so if you have any questions arising from what you've heard today, uh, if you would like any information on our services, then do please simply email us directly. There's a couple of email addresses up on the screen there. Um, or feel free to visit our website and contact us directly through any of the forms which are on multiple pages uh, throughout the website. So thanks again, Andy. Uh, thank and thank you, you everyone else, uh, for your attention today. I uh, re really do appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedules to listen in. Um, as I said in the introduction, this is actually the final webinar in the current series, which has been our third series. Um, and we hope to run the next series uh, in the sort of first quarter next year. I mean, if anybody's still on the line and they've got any suggestions for um, webinar topics they'd like to hear about, then you could just type them into the chat now or just simply send a, an email into the uh, those email addresses or, or, or through the website. We'd love to hear from you. We're trying to provide things that we think people will find interesting and insightful and sort of help them in their day-to-day their, their, their -day work. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, so in the, what we'll do now is we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, so please stay safe and stay secure.